All right, uh, welcome to chapter six. We're still in phase two, the system analysis phase of the SDLC, the way the book uh, chapters are all aligned. And this is all about object modeling. We talked about data flow modeling last time. This is object modeling. And before we even start the chapter, I'm going to give you uh, a brief rant on what object oriented is all about. Typically, you hear the term when referring to programming, like object-oriented programming. Although the concepts are actually so generic that you could use them for, you know, designing a car, building a car. Here's basically how it works. Uh, the, the whole concept of object-oriented programming is to isolate chunks of a problem into smaller pieces um, so that one piece uh, is easily to manage and that it doesn't have any side effects. So for example, you make a tweak over here, it's not going to affect anything over here. Uh, before object-oriented programming, uh, here's a common scenario. Uh, you know, you're looking through this long, you know, listing of program uh, code, and you run across something kind of strange, and you go, I wonder why they did that. I mean, that's just crazy. Uh, why don't we make that a little bit more uh, normal here? I'm going to go in there and tweak that. And so uh, I say, well, you know, the normal way to, to do this would be this way. And so you hit the button and everything works and you think cool I just made some improvements and then you get a tech support call saying hey we can't print anymore and you go well is it possible that change I made here is the cause for it not printing and so you go put it back the way it was and sure enough everything prints fine well that's side effect you're working on you know the the uh, the file open uh, dialogue and you make a little tweak and it affects the printing over here in some other part of the application so the bits and pieces of the application are so intertwined that one little tweak over here has catastrophic effects everywhere else the point of object oriented programming is that you break these things up into smaller chunks but the chunks are things that are self-contained so that things that happen in here only happen in here. If I make a change in here, it's not going to affect anything else. That's the whole point. And uh, you might think to yourself, oh, okay, those are cool words. I, I guess I can remember that for a test. But it, it's it's actually more than that. There's kind of a philosophy involved in this. Uh, let's say you're a uh, just a hobbyist programmer and you're working on, on an application and some part of it doesn't run. If you used object-oriented programming, you can zero in on that one little thing you're working around. Uh, knowing darn well that the problem couldn't possibly be over here or over here or over here. And so it allows you to focus your energy on the spot that needs attention. That makes things go real well, particularly when you're debugging something that doesn't work. And the other thing is, you know, our brains are just not meant to remember that many things. And I don't want to have to remember all that stuff. I want to be able to, you know, zoom in, so to speak, to a part of a program I'm working on and remember only those things. And again, knowing full well that I could uh, swap this out, change it out, put another one in, and it won't affect anything else. Okay, now you might be nodding your head going, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But from a business perspective, do you, do you kind of see an opportunity here? If I had one giant monolithic application, um, if I hired two more programmers to help out, uh, they probably wouldn't be that much help because there's no real way for them to jump in. But if I had object-oriented programming, I could break this application up into chunks. And I could say, Susie, I want you to take this routine. And Susie can go off to her cube and work on just that piece and not even care what Bob is doing over here working on his piece. All they have to do is make sure that the interfaces, where those, where those little things touch, where they touch each other, is those are well-defined. That's all we have. So inside that little black box, um, you don't have to know what happens inside that thing as long as you define the interfaces so that they can talk. And so that's the essence of object-oriented programming. It allows you to break things up into smaller chunks. It, it makes for easy debugging because you know darn well there's no side effects. It allows your your be able to hold more, more things or actually fewer things, fewer things uh, in your head at the same time and allows uh, businesses to speed up the development by assigning a, a project to a team of programmers rather than just uh, one or two programmers that have to slog through the whole thing. So object-oriented programming, it's not like, ooh, this is a new concept. No, it's been around a long time. 
and of course everyone's using it. Okay, enough of my rant. Let's get back to the book, page 224. Uh, I'm going to go over the chapter objectives like we always do. So, you're supposed to be able to explain how object-oriented uh, analysis can be used to describe an information system and define object modeling terms uh, such as objects, attributes, methods, methods, classes, and instances. Uh, explain relationships among objects and the, and the concept of inheritance. Uh, draw an object or relationship diagram. Describe the unified modeling language, UML. The, the tools, techniques, inclu including use case, uh, class diagram, sequence diagram, state transition diagrams, all those kind of things. Explain the advantages of using case tools in, uh, during this phase of the development. And explain how to organize an object model. Okay. So kind of as an overview, um, they, they start with, you know, object modeling and we're going to learn about how it differs from the structured analysis and blah, 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 blah. So these are the, the five steps that we're going to use for this chapter. So kind of starting off again on page 226, uh, don't forget the, uh, the running uh, case study, uh, the preview case study. I really like those things. I think they're excellent. So take a minute to read those things. Okay, so on page 226, they talk about, in general terms, that, uh, you know, object-oriented analysis, you know, describes the information system by identifying things called objects. And rather than concentrate on, uh, you know, the previous things where we concentrated on data and the flow of data, uh, here we're, we're concentrating on things that are a little bit higher altitude, so to speak. We're... we're talking about um, the a, a chunk of a project. You know, you have a, a system that you're building and you're going to break it up into smaller chunks. So we're talking about a, a chunk. Okay. The methodology is popular because it integrates easily with object-oriented programming languages. And that is exactly right. I mean, when you're done with one of these object models, uh, you could quite literally take the object model and, and uh, drop it into Visual Studio and build the, the framework for your application. That's pretty doggone cool. And of course, uh, programmers like object-oriented because it's modular, it's reusable, easy to maintain, all those good things we talked about at the beginning. Okay, uh, continuing on page 226, they talk about some terms that you're going to need. Now, I will warn you that I don't particularly like some of the terminology that the book uses. So I'm going to kind of tweak it a little bit as we go through here because I'm not going to call things exactly the way they call it. They're not wrong per se. It's just that uh, from a programmer perspective, I, I want to use the terms in, in their more classical sense. So I'm going to make some tweaks as we go along and you'll be able to catch up. It won't be, it won't be difficult. Okay, so the terms. Uh, you need to know a little about the you know, unified modeling language, which we'll demonstrate here in Visio at the end of the chapter attributes. Uh, these are the characteristics of an object. So an object could be like um, a car and the attributes are the the things like how many wheels and how many horsepowers and how many doors. Those are attributes. They're also uh, nouns, right? So a car has a whole series of nouns. Um, Next one is methods. Uh, methods are the, the things that you do with or to a car. So like turn left, turn right, go faster, go slower. Uh, those are actions, you know, action and verbs. So, you know, attributes are nouns, actions are verbs. Kind of makes sense, right? Uh, messages. Messages are the actual command you give to the car, like you know, step on brake. You know, that's the message. Uh, which causes the slow car down method to work. Uh, a class. Now here's where they make some strange distinctions. I make a, a tremendous distinction between a class and an object. Uh, they do not. So here's my view of uh, the difference between the two. The, the class is the blueprint for the car. And an instance of that class is a real car. That's not too complicated, is it? Object is a blueprint, and an instance of a class is an object. And objects are real. 
And uh, in programming class, of course, this is not a programming class. But in a programming class, it's a very common mistake to confuse the the uh, blueprint with the with the real thing. And, and if you ever took one of my programming classes, I talk about you know a recipe for chocolate chip cookies. If you ate the recipe, uh, it would probably taste like like paper, right? It, it would taste very good. But chocolate chip cookies taste pretty doggone good. So don't eat the recipe. Eat the cookie. That's what I tell in my programming classes. Okay, so uh, I'm going to make some distinction between an instance of a class. Object is an instance of a class, and they just call everything objects here, which is technically okay at, at this level. But everywhere they say class, I mean, I'm sorry, every place they say object, I'm probably going to say class. Okay. So continuing that kind of thinking on page 227, they talk about what an object is. And in the, in the classical sense, it represents a person, place, or thing. It, it's a, 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 it's that, that encapsulization we talked about, that small chunk of something uh, that is self-contained and has no side effects. That's kind of the, the funky definition of object-oriented programming. And uh, they usually uh, use these little rounded triangles to, to show them off. And um, they have an object name, and it would be kind of cool if the object names uh, were unique, right? Kind of makes sense. And they have, you know, methods and, and attributes like we talked about before. Okay. So on page 227, they kind of basically talk about this. Now, I would call this a parent class okay so this is a parent class and all parents um, have a name an age a sex and a hair color well I guess they couldn't maybe you won't have hair color but anyway and in this particular scenario all parents have a method and it's reading a bedtime story and uh, driving in the carpool so this is a, a recipe that's kind of a strange concept, a recipe for a parent. Hmm. Well, I guess if you're a science fiction guy, you'd probably appreciate the reference. But um, this is a recipe that would be appropriate for any parent. And so here are instances of the class. So this is the parent object, and here's some examples of an instance of a class which is an object. So Mary Smith is, a, is an instance of the parent object. And Anthony Green is an instance of a parent class. I said object last time. Doggone it. Okay, so um, these are examples of a fully populated, so to speak, um, class. And because they use this word instance of a class, the 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 way you get from a blueprint to a car or a recipe to a chocolate chip cookie is you know you assemble the car or you bake the cookie in object oriented terms they use this term called instantiation ooh wow somebody was up late at night coming up with that huh an instantiation so i instantiate a class to create an object and you can probably tell the root of the word is instance. So it's instantiation means create an instance of. I don't know why they didn't just say create an instance of, but you know, hey, somebody had to get a new term out there. So this is essentially the overview of uh, parent class and an example of some parent objects. Okay. Um, Kind of going along, they have some more examples there that make a little bit more sense. Uh, the parent one is a little odd, uh, but the, if you keep going talking about the dog object, and they say, okay, all dogs, you know, have the following: they have name, they have a breed, they have age, they have color, they have sex, they have fe favorite food, and they do, you know, roll over, play dead, you know, all sorts of cool uh, methods you can do with a dog. And then you have instance of a dog. Uh, so these objects are real dogs, and uh, the dog class is just kind of a generic thing. It's not real. You can't touch it. You can't feed it. It's just a, a description of any dog. Okay, this is probably a good place to stop for the 15-minute mark, and we'll see you again in a few.